baby on the deals, Nick. It is the last lecture we're going to do on currency control. Um, again, as a reminder for everyone, what's on the on the dock of you, homework four is due next Monday, uh, and then project three will be due the, the Monday after that. Okay, and, and is everything on Gradescope working yet or no? I haven't checked. It's working? Okay, awesome. All right. All right, so today we're going to talk about multi version concurrent control. And so this is a, a slight misnomer in the term because it's not going to be a concurrent control protocol in the way that we talked about two phase locking and timestamp ordering. So this isn't another category that you could use to do concurrent control, but rather it's a way to architect the system uh, when you have concurrent operations or concurrent transactions or queries by relying on, on multiple versions or maintaining multiple versions. And so we, we sort of saw this last class when we were talking about OCC, right? We talked about how uh, transactions would maintain a private workspace, and any time they wrote to an object or copied it or read an object, they would copy it into their private workspace. So that was sort of like maintaining multiple versions, except that the version that the transaction generated which was only visible or only viewable by, by itself. Right? The private workspace, you know, another transaction couldn't read anything that was inside of it. It was only per, you know, it was local to the transaction. And so it's sort of like so multi-version current control is sort of like that idea, but instead of having a private workspace where we maintain these different versions, we're actually now going to have the versions be part of the global database. And we're going to figure out how, you know, determine whether some version is, view, uh, is, is visible to a particular transaction. So what's going to happen is every single time that a transaction updates an object, uh, it's going to make a new version. So the way you think about this is that we're going to have uh, the distinction between logical versions and physical versions. Or, right, so there'll, there'll be a, a logical tuple. Right, that only really has sort of one logical version. Like, if I want to read the tuple with the key A, there's only I, the, the, from the application standpoint, I only see that, that. Sorry, I only see that one tuple. The, but underneath the covers inside of our database system, it's going to maintain multiple physical versions for that single logical object. Right. All right. So when when we write a transaction, writes to an object, updates it, we create a new physical version. And then when we read an object, we have to figure out which physical version is, is, the, is the visible representation of that logical object to my transaction. And you're, you could have, you know, your transaction could be running, my transaction could be running, and what is visible to me versus you can be completely different. Okay? So that's the high level, that's the idea of what we're doing here today. So the idea of multi-version concurrent control, or MVCC, as it's, as it's normally called, or in short, uh, goes back to the, the 1970s. So the first, uh, the, the first reference to this idea was actually in a dissertation by somebody, a PhD student at MIT, in 1978. Um, and then there's a bunch of papers from Phil Bernstein, who I mentioned last class, that come around in the, the late 1980s, or sorry, early 1980s, and they, they, they referenced this dissertation as the first example of multi-version concurrent control. So the, but the first real implementation of it uh, wasn't until a, a few years after that, like early 1980s, 1983, 1984, uh, at the company called DEC. Uh, you may not have heard of that. DEC was one of the sort of a large computer company in the 1980s. They got bought by Compaq, and then Compaq got bought by HP. So it's no longer around anymore, but they did a lot of early pioneering database work. Uh, so the first implementation of, uh, of MVCC in a database system was this product out of DEC called RDB VMS, right? the relational database system for VMS. Uh, VMS was an old operating system. If, or if you've ever heard of VAX, same thing. Um, and then there was another system they implemented also at DEC a few years after that called Interbase. Um, and so both of these projects, RDB, VMS, and Interface, they were both uh, uh, being built by this guy, Jim Starkey. Um, Jim Starkey was like, you know, sort of a, one of the early data pioneers, like he, he, he claims he invented blobs, he claims he invented triggers. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's what Wikipedia says. Um, so he actually implemented both of these versions of MCC and, and DEC, or at, at RDB and Interbase. And then he later on went to go found NeoDB, which is a newer database startup uh, out of Boston, which also does use MVCC. Um, so DEC RDB 
got sold to Oracle and now is called Oracle RDB. So this is where things get confusing. Now you start to see why I want to write the database of databases, my, the encyclopedia, because it's hard to keep track of all these things. So there's the Oracle database, there's the Oracle relational database, and then there's the Oracle RDB database. And Oracle RDB is from the DEC RDB. And then Interbase uh, when was later sold off by DEC, and then uh, it went through a couple of different uh, holding companies. Eventually it was open source, I think the late 19, 1990s. All right, and now the open source version is called Firebird, but Interbase still exists. It's now like a, mo a, a mobile embedded database, and as far as I know, it's still the same code from the 1980s. Um, so RDB, or sorry, Firebird is not as well known as MySQL and Postgres, but it's one of the earliest uh, open source database systems out there. So if you ever wonder why Firefox is called Firefox, the, the web browser, Firefox was originally called Phoenix. They had to change the name because it conflicted with another company. Then they called it, wanted to call it Firebird, they couldn't call it that because that conflicted with this database. So then they had to change the name to Firefox, <laughs> right? So again, these are good examples of, 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 of the earliest in implementations of, of MVCC. So the basic concept that you need to understand about MVCC, the way it's going to work, the, the benefit you're going to get from this is that the writers are not going to block the readers, and the readers are not going to block the writers. It's only when you have two transactions trying to write to the same object at the same time, then we have to fall back and rely on two-phase locking or OCC or, or the other concurrent show protocols that we talked about before. Okay? And so the, the high-level concept of how this is going to work is that we're going to assign timestamps to transactions when they arrive in the system, and we're going to provide them with a consistent snapshot of the database that existed at the moment or at the time that they arrived. And what I mean by this is that they're not going to see any changes from transactions uh, that, have, that did not commit yet at the moment the snapshot was created. And this is a virtual snapshot. It's not like we're copying the database and, and putting it to another location that your transaction runs on. We're going to use these timestamps to figure out what is actually visible to you. So it's sort of like this virtual time, uh, snapshot that we're going to generate for you as you go along and, and execute queries and try to read data. So if you're a read-only transaction, this is actually uh, an awesome thing because now if I show up, I declared you to the data system I'm read-only, which we showed how to do that last class. And now the data system won't require you to acquire any locks or maintain any read-write sets for your transaction. Because you're going to have a consistent snapshot, you're only going to see things that exist at the moment you started. right? That's super efficient. That's really fast to do. And this is sort of the example I was saying before, like just because you can declare, some systems let you declare the data that your transaction is read-only, doesn't mean the system is going to optimize it, uh, optimize your transaction, make it run faster. And so the way you actually would optimize it was just again not maintain any rewrite sets, right? If you if you ha if you have a consistent snapshot. The other advantage you're going to get from MVCC is that you're going to support what are called time travel queries. So the way to think about this is like you can tell the data system, run my query, but not on the current state of the database. Run on the state of the database as it existed three hours ago, or three days ago, or three years ago. And you can use these timestamps that we're going to have embedded inside of our tuples to go back and say, well, what was the timestamp range that would have been visible to me if I ran three weeks ago? And now I, I, I know to skip, out the late, skip on the latest versions and only read the versions that existed at that point in time. So this idea goes actually was one of the uh, one of the original inventions of Postgres in the 1980s, right? To support this idea of time travel queries, um, it actually doesn't exist in Postgres now. They took it out in the 1990s, the late 1990s, when the when it, Postgres came out of academia and it started being used outside of uh, out of Berkeley. Um, and the reason is because essentially what they're doing is just turning off garbage collection on the older versions. So you're just accumulating all these old versions at, at, as your transactions are updating uh, the database. And of course, now you're going to run a disk space very quickly if you're, if you're making a lot of changes. So Postgres now has the thing called the vacuum, right? and that's essentially doing the garbage collection. Um, as far as I know, uh, I say this every year, and every year I, I, I go talk to companies, I always ask them uh, who actually needs time travel queries. The only sort of uh, application domain that I've seen where people tell me, yes, we care about time travel queries, is in, in uh, the financial companies, because they have to do this for regulation uh, compliance. Right, they have to maintain the last seven years of uh, the history of, of all the financial transactions. 
So they want to be able to say, you know, what was my, what is my risk assessment? What, what is my total amount of money that I have a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, things like that. But as far as I know, again, if you think about it, most, you know, think every website you access, you don't really say, you know, show me the state of the, the website as it existed three years ago, All right? All right, so let's look at an example of how MSTC is going to work. So the first thing we're going to point out is that now in our, in our table, uh, we're going to maintain um, this, this version header, this version field. And we'll just assume that this is going to be the, like the, the unique key for our, 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 our objects, our tuples. So this is saying object, there's an object with key A, and the, the subscript I'm using says at version 0. Then we're also going to now have a begin and end fields. So these are going to be timestamps, whether they're logical timestamps or physical timestamps or hybrid timestamps, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it has to have the same guarantee that we talked about last time, timestamp ordering. It has to always be moving forward in time. We can't roll back. Um, and this, these two fields are going to be determined when this particular version of the tuple was visible. And so now what I can do is when my transaction shows up, I'm assigned a, a timestamp. I can use my timestamp, because it's in the same domain as these begin and end timestamps, to figure out whether that particular tuple version is visible, visible to me or not. So just thing to point out here, I'm not even talking about uh, two-bays locking or OCC or any of that here. This is just how to figure out what versions are visible to me. All the same things we talked about in the last two classes are still applicable here when we start to have write-write conflicts. All right, so my transaction, transaction T1 starts, and it has timestamp 1. So I, I want to read object A. Ignoring how I got to this, right? how I got to this particular tuple. Right? We can talk about indexes later, but for our purposes, we don't care. We just know that we want to do a scan on our table, and we want to find the version of A that is visible to us. So it's obviously, you know, we only have one version at this point. It's assume there was some transaction that loaded this in, had timestamp 0. So it's, it's set, set, you know, it's the only version we have. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the begin timestamp and the end timestamp to figure out whether this is visible to us at timestamp 1. So the begin is 0, meaning there was transaction with timestamp 0 created it. But then the end is null. And this means that this is the latest version of this tuple. There is no other tuple that comes in logical time after our, our, this, this particular version here. Right? So at this point, you know, this is the only version. 1 is between 0 and infinity. So we're allowed to read this version because it's visible to us. So we go ahead and do that. Now we start transaction T, T2, and it wants to do a write on A. So the way this is going to work is you're going to create a new version, A1, right? because we're always sort of incrementing the, the version counter up. Uh, and we're going to set the end timestamp to of the previous version to be our timestamp, right? So we created the new version, A1, right? We updated the new value. The begin timestamp is our, is our, is our timestamp. And then we go back up here, and we set the end timestamp to be 2. Because this now says, for version A1, sorry, version A0, that version for A is only visible between timestamp 0 and 2. Anybody that comes after this, say timestamp 3, would skip, skip this version and look at this one, because this one is 2 to infinity. So what's one obvious problem with this? Right? So we, we, we know that it's, we, we, we have enough information in our timestamps to tell us whether it's actually visible or not. Right? If I'm timestamp 3, I can look and say, all right, well, this is, I can't read this, because 3 is not between 0 and 2. Oh, but I can read this one. Yes? No? What's that? He says you may have too many copies. We're not there yet. We'll, we'll worry about that later. So we don't have any information to know about what the hell's going on with the transaction that made this change, right? What if this thing aborts, right? I got to go back and now reverse that to make sure that uh, somebody doesn't think that, that this is actually not an actually visible version. So one way to do this, again, you could go back and when, on abort, undo all the, the end timestamps to reverse them back to be what they were before. But if I update a billion tuples, then that's going to be a lot of writes to do that on abort. 
So one way to get around this is actually maintain a, an additional table called the transaction status table, where you just say, all right, well, if you want to find out what's going on with the, the transaction that created, it has timestamp two, here's its current status. So if anybody comes along and wants to read this version, right, and it says, oh, I skip this, well, I can check this and say, well, it's still active. So as far as I know, at this point in time, this, this version is not visible to me, and I should go to the next one. Yes? Why not change the database after the transaction commit? So his question is, why don't, change, why don't I change the database? Meaning, why don't I change the end timestamp? Not, so not worry about committing, right? At this point, if we commit, this, is, this, is, this information is correct, right, between 0 and 2. It's for aborts. Mm -hmm. If I abort, then i got to go back and say, well, what are, what are all the tuples that t, the transaction T2 modified? Let me go back and remove, you know, flip out their timestamp. Yeah, so, like, if you just update the table when the transaction is being committed, that means, like, there is some inconsistency in the database. So you, you, may, you may see this version for, for this tuple, but you may see the other version of another tuple. So he says, uh, he says that um, if you do it this way, that it's, it's, there's inconsistency where you see different versions of the same tuple. Yeah, because like, this transaction is not committed. Yes. So there's just part of the transaction done, and another part is still undone. So right. Not yet, right. All right, so his statement is that for this particular transaction, I made a change in the global database. Anybody that comes, comes along can now read this, right? Well, it depends on the isolation level. I'm ignoring all that. I'm ignoring what, how, what concurrency or protocol you're actually using. For now, that's fine. So this guy over here, right? So say we're doing two-phase locking. Again, readers don't block writers. And writers don't block readers under MVCC. So this guy over here, he's not taking a, a shared lock on the tuple. He just says, all right, I'm, I, can read, I can read any tuple that's within, that existed at timestamp one or before. So I can read A, that's fine. Later on, I'll, I'll read A again, that's fine. I don't need to acquire a shared lock for this. For this guy over here, he does the write on A, and then depending on what isolation level you're running at, and depending on what uh, concurrent protocol you're using, you could take an exclusive lock on this to prevent anybody else from, from, from reading this. But we're ignoring that. It's just, we're just trying to understand how we figure out what's visible to you or not. OK? All right, so again, at this point here, T2 updated, uh, the, the, uh, updated A. So we created a new version, A1. And then we updated its end timestamp. Then we flip back over here. And this is the point I was making to him, is now I'm going to read A, right? And my timestamp is still 1. So if I go look in here, well, I can't read 2 to infinity because 1 is less than 2. So this is the version I want, I want to read. And I'm guaranteeing, you know, now I have a repeatable read. I'm reading the same thing that I had before. Right? So I go ahead and, and you know, commit, and everyone's fine. And that means, you know, we'll blow away the transaction table. Pretty straightforward, right? All right, so let's look at an example now when there's conflicts. Right? So uh, again, T1, T2. T1 is going to read on A, write on A, then read on A. T2 is going to read on A and write on A. And again, and we st we're starting back off where we had before, where we only have a single version here. Right? And it starts from 0 to infinity. So right, we read A. That's fine. Right? We write A. We're going to create a new version here, right? A1. And then we're going to set its begin timestamp to be 1, set the end timestamp to be infinity, go back and update the end timestamp for the previous version, and set that to 1. Then we now start this transaction over here. So the first thing we got to do is we got to add an entry into our transaction status table to say we're, we're an active transaction timestamp 2. And then we want to read A. But for this one here, we could, depending on what protocol we want to use, we could either, either rate, read A0 or read A1, right? Assuming we're running with serializable isolation, right? So we want to see a consistent snapshot of, of the database. So in this case here, we're going, to read a, we're going to read A, but at version A0, because we would say, when we look at this guy here, this one is still considered active. So we don't, it's not actually been committed yet, so we don't want to read that, because it didn't actually exist before we started. Right, because still, the transaction's still in flight. So we're going to read A0, uh, but now we want to go write a, a. And for this one here, 
we're going to have to stall, right? Because now we're going to have a write-write conflict. So assuming we're doing two-phase locking, we would try to acquire the exclusive lock on A. We can't do that, right? And so assuming we're running a deadlock detection, we're going to stall and wait until uh, we find out what happens with, with, with T1. So then we switch back over here. We read A, and then we're going to read the version that we just wrote earlier. So that's fine. Then we go ahead and commit, and we blow our entry in the, or we update our entry in, in the transaction status table to say we've committed. So now when we switch back over to this guy here, we can create our new version. But depending on, again, this depends on what concurrency protocol we want to use. If you're running at read committed or something less, then we're allowed to do this. If we're running at serialization, then we shouldn't be allowed to do this. So the idea here is I just I want to say that the, the, the multi-verging aspect is independent of the concurrency protocol stuff we talked about before. Yes? So he says, wouldn't this call branch cause branching in the database? Uh, no, because in this particular example, we're just going to overwrite, you know, whatever the version A1 here is, we're now the newer version. Don't think of this as like Git, where you have like branches. It's, it's only a linear history. So if you're running serialization, serial serialized isolation. Yeah, so it should be like T1 before T2 or T2 before T1. Yes. But this seems like T1 executed on A0, but T2 still executed on A0. Right, so this is not running serialized isolation. But you say because you read a, uh, in T2, you read A from A0, but not A1. So you read A here. You read A. Yeah, so it's not serializable. It's snapshot isolation. So I'm running this not seeing. I'm running this with a consistent snapshot of the database. So at this point here, I read A. So the snapshot says I should only see things that were visible, that were committed at the moment my transaction started. So at this point in time, there is a new physical version A1. But that does not, did not exist before we started. Or sorry, it was not committed before we started. So we look at this and say, well, we're, our t 2 timestamp is 2. So this is actually visible to us. But then we go look in our transaction status table, and we say, oh, T1 is, hasn't committed yet. So this version is not visible to us. All right, so when T2 commits, you will see like there's A1 and A2 in the database. And A2 is like the T, T2 just executed without uh, T1. I mean, like, if, uh, if you if you examine the content of uh, A2, you will see this is caused. This is kind of like from A0 to A2, but there's nothing to do with T1. Right. You you're sort of you're applying sort of get concepts to this, which is not the same thing. There's no branching. It's it's a linear history. So in physically, it's a, it's a linked list, and we have all these versions. Logically. In this case here, if you're not running serialized isolation, then yes, in theory, you're sort of jumping over a version. But it's but it's not like there's a diff between the there is and there, I'm getting I'm getting jumping ahead. It's not like again in Git where you know here's the branch history and where things got merged together, right? It's not like that way at all. We're just doing we're just saying here's the new version. We don't we don't this new version doesn't necessarily come from the previous one. Right, but you you don't know that. Maybe someone from like Right, but again, like it's like all you know is what the version before you was. You don't know like the full lineage. You're not maintaining that history inside of like each commit, right? You're also sort of applying a blockchain idea to this. It's not that way at all. Okay. Okay. He says it only exists partial ordering. Um, I don't use that word. I don't use that term either. Uh, Let's go forward. When I show you how it's actually being maintained with pointers, this might make more sense. OK. Any other questions? OK. Everyone's favorite. Let's do a demo. All right, so this is Postgres. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to get tra transaction IDs in, um, in, uh, in my SQL very easily, so we're just going to do Postgres. All right, so we're going to create the, um, the same table we had before last time, this transaction demo table. It has, just has two tuples, right? Uh, ID 1, ID 2, value 100, value 200. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a transaction at the top. Um, we're going to run this in the, oh, sorry. Let 
Let me really do all that. And then let me, let me load the table again. Because that was probably in there. I just probably just blew that away. Okay. So we're going to start a transaction at the top. And we're just going to read a single tuple. So remember I said before that the database system is going to maintain internal fields that keep track of the timestamps of when these, the version, the physical version of a logical tuple is visible to your transaction. So in Postgres, they call, they call these fields x min, x max, right? Oh, I can make this bigger, sorry. Hmm. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, right. So again, so I just read my tuple, and then here we see we have these fields x min, x max, and then the this I, this number here corresponds to the transaction ID that I just had that I used just to insert this 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 data into the database, and then it's setting the x max to be to be zero, right? That's sort of like infinity in our last example, right? To say that this is the latest version. So I can see what my current timestamp is for my transaction by executing this function here, txid underscore current, right? And my current, the transaction ID for my current transaction is 918, and this one's 917 because the last transaction I just, I just ran was the one that inserted this data, right? So now, if I go update this tuple, If I go back and, and read my, my table again, read my tuple again, right? Now you see that the, I've updated the value, but now the x min is, is the timestamp of my transaction, 918, right? And we know that Postgres is actually storing multiple physical copies of, of the, or maintaining different Multiple, the way it's maintaining these versions is actually mean, is, is making new tuples inside of the database is by running the, the same query, but now I'm going to include the CTID. Remember I said before when we talked about buffer pools and storage, like this is in Postgres, this is how they, this is what they're using to determine the page ID and the offset. So again, here's my transact, here's the, the, the start timestamp, 918, here's the, the max, it says zero, and then this is saying that this particular version that we're looking at is at page zero, offset three. And so now if I go back down here, down below, in the other, in the other terminal, right, and I run the same query, now you see is that the x min is what, what we had before, 917, because that was the transaction that in, inserted the, the entry. The x max is 918, because that's my transaction, because I added that to be the max to say this is the boundary, the end timestamp. And then my CTID is zero, 01. Page zero, offset one. So this is proving to us that this is actually a distinct physical tuple inside the database uh, than the one that I have up here. Is this clear? And so Postgres will actually maintain every single time you, you update a tuple, if you update the same tuple in, in, in a transaction, it always actually creates a new version. So if I go update this thing again, it doesn't overwrite the the original one that I, original version I created, it actually makes a new one, right? Again, 0, 3, 0, 4, but then the, the, the min, max, or the timestamp ranges are the same. All right, so now, I can start a new, I'll start a transaction down here, at the terminal on the bottom. And I'm running with on recommitted isolation level. And if I want to go read that same tuple, I see I get the original version, right? The one that starts at, at uh, 917. Because the guy at the top has not committed yet. So this is where, again, I'm looking at the versions and I'm saying, well, my, well, my timestamp, actually, we, we can do that too. So the timestamp for the guy on the bottom would be. 919, right? Again, these timestamps are always have to be increasing, so the Postgres is just using a logical counter. They add one to it, and, and 
and, th and they assign it to the current transaction. So again, like I, this is proving that I can read an older version of, of a tuple even though that a newer version exists because the guy at the top has not committed yet. So now if I go back up here and I commit, I come down here and I read it again, I get, I get the version that the guy just created. So again, this is what the isolation level, isolation level stuff is, is telling us, right? We're, even though we're maintaining these timestamps to figure out what's actually visible to, not, to us, we're running at read committed. So we're allowed to read things that are committed. If I do the same demo, so let's go back, let's reset the database. Hmm. All right, so we can do xmin, xmax, ctid. All right, so th there's the current version of the database. And now I'm going to run my transactions. Instead of running them in read committed, I'll run them in serializable isolation. Same thing at the bottom. All right, so now. I'll do, uh, let's, let's figure out what our timestamps are. This guy has timestamp 2.4, two this guy has, has 2.5, right, that's expected. The top guy will update this. Um, and we do a select, and we would see, that, you know, we, we, we successfully created a new version. Down here below, we do a select on that same thing. We should see the older version. All right, we do with value 100. Again, CTID is different. But now this bottom guy is going to try to update to the same tuple. What should happen here? It's going to stall, right? Because we're running serialized with isolation level. So now when we're doing, do, do, to do the update, we have to acquire the exclusive lock. And that lock is being held by, by the transaction at the top. So now let's say I commit this guy at the top. What should happen to the guy at the bottom? What's that? He says it should start up again. So after the top guy commits, he's saying that it should, should, the query should finish. We're running a serializable isolation. Should we be allowed to do that? What's that? He says abort rollback. Yes. Right? So even though there's multiple versions, right, and we could, we could in theory, create multiple versions, but it's sort of what he, what he was sort of asking about in the, the last slide, if you're running a serialized isolation, you're not allowed to do that. Even though we have multiple versions, you would not be allowed to create a new version uh, from another transaction. That Because that, you would not create a new version that would then overwrite a transaction that ran the same time you did and overwrite what you did. All right, one more demo. So let's roll everything back. Here is our, our table. Right, time, uh, time, min timestamp is 929. So now we'll run the top guy in serializable isolation. This guy's still in a transaction. The bottom guy will run as read uncommitted. Nope, it's about to run. All right, the bottom guy is running read read uncommitted. Top guy is running at in, in serializable. So we'll have the top guy. So everyone, everyone's going to read the table, right? So read it again. Looks like that. Down below, read the same thing. Everyone's seeing the same version, All right? The top guy will update tuple one. The bottom guy is going to update tuple two. Should this conflict? No, right? They're, they're different objects. They're different tuples. So that's fine. 
What should the top guy see? So it's going to see its own right for tuple 1. What will it see for tuple 2? What version? The original version, right? Same thing. So yeah, same thing. So yeah, so here we've updated. Well, here. So we see the old version of tuple 2. Uh, but we see that its timestamp has been set to the transaction at the bottom. Right? 931 here, 931 there. So again, this is all the physical me metadata for the tuple, but logically we're still seeing 2, 200. And then we see 1, 101, because that's what the tuple we updated. Right? And I, I, our timestamp is going to be. You know, 9.30, right? So let's look at, do the same select at the bottom. So I, I, I was, I was going to ask you what was going to happen. I it's just sort of spoiled it, right? So we see 2, 201, because that's what we updated. But we're seeing what? 1, 100. Should that happen? We're running it read uncommitted. So what does that mean? What's that? It's, not, it's running at a higher resolution level. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So you said it's running at a higher resolution level. So even though I told Postgres, I want read uncommitted, it can't actually do that because of these timestamps. right? It would actually have to do more work and say, all right, well, you're read uncommitted, and this other transaction is actually still active. so. Yeah, you should, you know, you could see this, but if I really want to make you be read uncommitted, let me go figure out where this guy's, this guy's versions is, and I'll, I'll let you read that one. So even though we told Postgres we want to be read uncommitted, it didn't actually do it for us. Right, because these timestamps are, or it's using these timestamps to figure out what's actually visible. Um, we can try the same thing in, um, in MySQL. Uh, I don't think I'm actually connected though. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So in MySQL, you don't say begin transaction. You have to say set set session transaction isolation level. So we'll set this guy to be serializable. We'll set the bottom one to be uh, read uncommitted. So in, in MySQL, I don't know how to get the, the, the timestamp information, right? So we're, we're just going to look at the, 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 role, the, the, the logical tuples. So we do a select at the top. All right, let's actually get everything. Sorry. Get everything there. Get everything there. All right, so that's the same. All right, so the top guy is going to update tuple 1. Bottom guy is going to update tuple two. What should the top guy see? Say it again. It says 101, 200. 101, 201. What does the bottom guy see? One one two one. We did run isolation, right? Serializable, right? <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Duh. Sorry. Yes. That's really stupid of me. We we're not actually running in transactions. All right. Let's go back. Begin. No. Get set isolation level. Make sure we do that. It's all SQL. It's all you know. It's, it's a universal language. Make sure we run isolation or run read uncommitted. Call begin. All right. Do a select. Do a select here. Right. Beginning. Everything's the same. 
And then let's do an update on tuple one. This guy is going to update tuple two. Installed. Why? The guy at the top has, has, a, has a shared lock on the tuple, right? So try to get the exclusive lock to update it, and it wasn't allowed to do that. Right? Because again, even though we're running redo committed, we still have to acquire exclusive locks to update things, right? We just can't blindly write to whatever we want. That can, that can mess things up. Yes? Is that it a different Say it again? Is that it a different so he says, uh, right, so this, at this point here, when we did the select, we hold the share lock on everything we read. That's why. Right, if I do this again, if I roll this guy back, roll this guy back, start transaction, I'm just gonna update it. Come down here, start my transaction. And if I do a select, this should block. But it doesn't because it's 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 uh, it's read uncommitted. If now I try to update tuple two, should this block? No, right? So now if I go back and read, I see 101, 201. What will this guy see? He says 101, 200. Right? So, again, bottom guy is running read and committed, top guy is running serializable. So, it's not allowed to, you know, it, it can't get the, uh, the share lock on the, 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 the share, can't get the share lock for the tuple where the guy below holds the exclusive lock for it. So, is, it, is this sort of, I mean, again, the, the main takeaway I want to prove from this is that. This is more a demo of the isolation levels rather than the different versions, because you can't, you know, we can't expect what the actual physical version IDs are. Um, the main thing I want, I, want, I want you to get out of this is that the, the isolation level, when you set your isolation level, it's for your transaction. It says what you're allowed to be exposed to. It doesn't affect what other people uh, can or cannot see. Yes? He says, if the second transaction is running read uncommitted, why should it be allowed to require a lock? Because it's two-phase locking. It's strict two-phase locking, so you're holding it till the end. So you, so you could, yes. Uh, so you think it's able to see any change that is uncommitted? There's no need to get a lock because you're pretty much sure that you see. So his statement is, if you're allowed to see any, yeah. So his statement is, and I agree with you, is that if you're running read and committed, who cares, right? Acquire the exclusive lock on the thing you need, make your change, and then immediately release the lock. Some systems actually do that. I don't know why they're not doing this, right? Again, it's, this is another good example of like, just because the textbook says this is how you do it, this is, like, this is what the high level concepts actually mean. In practice, people do things completely different. I don't know, I don't know enough about Postgres, or sorry, MySQL to understand what they're actually doing here. Okay. So is, it, is this, again, the main takeaway, the, the, the Postgres example is what I really guys wanted to focus on, right? this idea that these, you have these min and max timestamps, you have this transaction ID that's using to determine that, that it's in the same value domain as these timestamps, and you're using that to figure out what's visible to you or not. Okay? All right, so let's jump back into this. Okay. So... The, the, the thing I want to impress upon you and what the, what the rest of the lecture will be on is that MVCC is more than just these, these timestamps, right? There's all these other design decisions we're going to, have to make in order to actually implement a system that supports MVCC. And in our, uh, in, you know, just to show you how popular MVCC is, and as far as I know, every single database system, except for a small number of them, that has been created in the last 10 years, is using some variant of MVCC. And this is just a small smattering of, of the systems that I'm aware of based on the database of databases. Okay? So the other things we gotta worry about when we actually build a system that supports MVCC 
are the following things. So one is what is the concurrency of protocol we're using? Again, two-phase locking, uh, OCC, things like that. Then we've got to worry about how we're actually going to maintain these different versions, how we're going to clean up the old versions when they're not visible anymore, and how we're going to have our indexes point to the correct version. And the different systems all do different things, and there's trade-offs for all these things. All right, so the, as I said multiple times, the, the, all the stuff from the last two classes are applicable here. When we actually do a write, we have to then rely on other two-phase locking or OCC or basic timestamp ordering to figure out who should be allowed to write what object and what isolation level you know, are, are we, we going to run at. So there's nothing really to say uh, uh, about how we're going to do this. right? Again, it's just that we're maintaining different versions now. But all the same concepts still, still apply. So all the same deadlock detection, deadlock prevention, OCC private workspace, all of that is still applicable here. So again, we, we can skip over this because we've already covered this already. So now for version storage, we need a way to figure out, you know, for a particular tuple, we need to find the version that actually should be visible to us. I'm ignoring how, you know, the index points to things or how we should find this data, right? It's assume we're doing sequential scan on the entire table and we're going to look and say, all right, well, this is, we want this, we want this particular object, where do we find the version that we want? So the way we're going to implement this is we're going to maintain a, uh, a, an internal pointer field that is going to allow us to say, here's how to find the, the next or previous version in, in, for this particular logical tuple. So you can sort of think like we're forming a linked list that we can then jump into it and then scan across the linked list and say, you know, here's, here's, here's the different versions that I have. And they're going to be sorted based on their, uh, on the, on their timestamps. So the, the indexes are always going to point to what is called the head of the chain. And whether the head is the oldest tuple or the new, sorry, the oldest version or the newest version of that tuple depends on the implementation, right? And the, there's different schemes we can use to say where we're actually going to store these different versions. So the first approach is to use what is the most simplest thing is called the append only approach or the append approach. And this basically means that every single time we create a new version, we just copy the old version as a new tuple, a physical tuple in our, in our table space, and then just update it. And then we update our pointer to say, here's, here's, the, here's the next version. The next approach is usually what is called time travel storage. And this is where you have the uh, one table that's sort of the master version table that always has the, either the, the latest, you know, the latest copy of the tuple, the latest version. And then you copy out older versions into this other separate table called the time travel table. And then you just maintain the, you know, the pointers from the master version to the, the time travel table. And the last one, which in my opinion is the, is the best approach, is to do delta storage. And this sort of, sort of, sort of thing of this like is diffs in, in, in Git or subversion, where instead of copying the, the old version every single time and updating it, I'm just going to maintain the, uh, a small, uh, you know, small delta to say, here's the, what changed from the previous version. So let's go through each of these one by one. All right, so again, the, the append-only storage is the most simplest way to do this. It's just, you're just going to say, every time I create a new version, uh, a, new lot, a new physical version, it's just a new tuple in my table. Right? So let's say that we have a transaction here, and it want, wants to update object A. So somehow it would follow the version chain to say, uh, this is the version I want to update. So when I want to create a new version, I just find an empty space in my, in my, in my table space or sl empty slot in my table space, and then copy the values out of the old version into the new version, and then update it. And then I update the pointer from the old version to now point to uh, my new version. And now this version is, is installed. All right, so Postgres does this. Uh, actually, Postgres is probably the most famous one that, that does this. So another aspect of this we, we have to actually, uh, now consider is also what, in, in what way we want to order the ver these versions. So my example here, assuming that this is, the, this is the head of this version chain, this is actually the oldest version. So let's say I follow the index, find key A, the index will point me to this version here, but if I want the latest version, I've got to follow this version chain to get down to here. So 
in my example, I did it oldest to newest, but you could do it also newest to oldest. And there's performance implications and trade-offs for all these, you know, these, these two different approaches. So again, oldest to newest means that anytime I, I, uh, I create a new version, all I have to do is just follow the, find the end of the, of the version chain, append my new tuple, and update the last, last guy. Right? So that's really easy to do. If you go newest to oldest, then you got to add the new entry, and then its pointer now points to the old head, but then you now you got to go, go update all of the indexes to now point to your new version. Right? Again, if I do my lookup on A, in this example here, I would land here, and this is the oldest version, and if I want the newest version, i got to follow the version chain. If I reverse this, if I had A2 be the head of the chain, then any index that was pointing to A1 before, I now need to go update them and have them point to A1. Or sorry, have, have them point to A2. So, um, oh, I didn't, it's missing the, the bolt, sorry. I have a, there's a great, uh, there's a great blog article from, um, from, uh, there's a great art blog, blog article from Uber that shows you why, uh, how this actually matters a lot. And I can't actually get to this stupid thing, sorry. Should not be updating slides on the fly. Uh, oh, this is embarrassing. I can't do it. All right, whatever. All right, sorry. Oh, I went right back to the beginning, sorry. That sucks. All right. Uh, I was, I, whatever. There's this blog article from Uber that basically shows how they switched from MySQL to Postgres back to MySQL because the even though MySQL and Postgres are both doing uh, version store or uh, you know, multi-versioning, they are uh, one was doing oldest and newest, one was doing new, newest old, oldest, and so in the case of Postgres is doing uh, newest to oldest. So every single time you would update a version you'd have to go update all, all the indexes, and that'd be expensive to do. And they had a lot of secondary indexes. All right, so uh, the next way you can store versions is to do the time travel table. So the way this is gonna work, we're gonna have our main table that's always gonna have the, the latest version of the tuple, and then we'll have a separate table space called the time travel table, where we just copy uh, the old versions in, uh, as they get modified into that, that other table. So say our transaction wants to update A2 here, we're going to copy A2 into a free slot in the time travel table, right? And then we update the version pointer now to say, you know, if you, if you want to go backwards, here, here's, here's the old version. And then we overwrite now the master version in the, uh, in the main table to be our, our, new, you know, our new value. Right? And, the, the, and then we update the, the, the pointer to point to the, the version we copied over. So the... The reason why you want to do this is because this actually makes garbage collection somewhat, somewhat easy to do because there's only one space to look. There's only, you, you just look in the time travel table, right? Um, and then you can also physically store these two tables in different formats, right? You could have one be a column store versus one be a row store, right? Dep depending on, on your environment. All right, the last approach, as I said, which I think is the best way to do this, um, and again, Postgres is actually using the append storage, and I've seen blog articles from some of their, their, their main developers, they actually want to switch to, to this approach. And this is what actually MySQL and Oracle do. So what's going to happen is every time you're going to do an update, you're just going to copy the values that were modified into this separate delta storage segment. And in, in, in MySQL, they call this the rollback segment. So I'm going to update, uh, update A, I'm going to update the value here. So I'll copy, make a copy of, of of the the old value for value field into my into my delta storage, and then just update the pointer to say if you want to go back in time for for a, here's where to go, right? And the same thing, it looks a lot like the the, the time travel table. If I want to update it again, I want to maintain, uh, you know, I want to have pointers to all these different versions. So what's going to happen is if you need to read an old version, you're essentially almost like replaying the deltas to put the tuple back into the, its original form that it should be for your, you know, for th that existed at your timestamp. So the, this is another good example of the trade-offs between reads versus writes. 
So to read old versions in the append only version approach is super easy because I just find the version that I want and then boom, everything's there. In this case here, writes are gonna be much, much faster because I don't have to copy the whole tuple if I want to make a change to a subset of its attributes. But now to do a read on an old version, I essentially got to replay the log, or replay the deltas to put me back into my correct form. So again, Postgres will be, more, will be faster for reads. My Seagull will be faster for writes because they do this. And it actually makes the, the, the overall, overall size of the database much smaller because you know, if I have 1,000 fields and I only update one of them for every single transaction, then my delta storage is going to be super small. Whereas if in, in, my, in Postgres, with the append-only approach, I'm copying that, well, every 1,000 field, every, all 1,000 fields every single time, even though I update one of them. All right, the, the third thing we got to worry about is garbage collection. Right? Again, all these old versions are accumulating. Right? Our transactions are finishing. And at some point, we're going to know that no, a particular version will not be visible to any other active transaction. Right? There's no active transaction with a timestamp that fits in, in the ranges from these old guys. So we want to go ahead and, and blow them away to reclaim the space. So it's more than just, just sort of like, uh, you know, just saying, I'm, I'm just going to sweep everything and try to figure it out. We have to worry about how we're going to look for these expired versions. And we got to figure out when it's actually safe to reclaim them. Right? So this, these two things we're sort of going to punt on for the most part. Uh, we'll cover this uh, in the advanced class if you take that. I just want to describe at a high level the mechanisms you can use to implement garbage collection. So the, the two ways to do this is either tuple level or transaction level. So tuple level basically means that we're going to essentially do sequential scans on our tables and have them look at the, 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 the timestamps to figure out, oh, I know what actual transactions I have. Is, any, is this actually visible to any transaction? If no, then I go ahead and want to prune it. And the reason why this, this, is, this is complicated or expensive to do is because not only do we got to look at the pages that are in memory, we got to look at the pages we, we may have swapped out on disk too. Right? Because we want to vacuum everything. So the two approaches that do background vacuuming or cooperative cleaning, which I'll show in the next slide. And then a second approach to doing this, which we won't really discuss, is just you have the transactions maintain the read write sets. And you know when they commit, you know whether anybody is actually, could actually see those old versions. And then once you know it's no longer visible, then you can just blow it away. So you can rely on like almost the private workspace that you've generated for, in, under OCC. You can think of that as the, the read write set of the transaction, because it is. And you just maintain that after they commit. And at some later point, you go clean up anything that, they, that they've created. But I want to talk about the tuple level garbage collection, because that's, this, this one's the most common. So say I have two threads running my system. They have two active transactions, T1, T2. T1 has timestamp 12. T2 has timestamp 25. So the first approach is to do background vacuuming. And think of this as like just you have a, uh, one or more threads in the background, get kicked up every so often, and they're just going to do sequential scans on, on, on every single table, look at what transactions are active to, to me, and figure out whether they're actually visible or not. Right? So you have some thread. It says, goes, go to some vacuum thread, you go to the, the transaction threads, and you say, what are your current transaction IDs? 12 and 25. Then you look in this table here, and then you just do a sequential scan and figure out whether, uh, based on these two numbers here, whether the, these tuples could ever actually be visible to them. So between 1 and 9, that's not visible to 12 or 25, so we know that we can reclaim these uh, and throw them away, whereas this last one is actually still visible. And again, this is just a sequential scan. We're not doing anything. There's no fancy way to do this. So that means that uh, if we start throwing things out at a buffer pool because we have to bring things into va vacuuming, like that, that's unavoidable. So this is a good example where you could have a separate buffer pool just for the vacuum thread so it doesn't interfere with the, the regular worker pool thread. So one obvious problem with this, again, is that there may be a portion of the, of the database, a portion of a table, that hasn't been modified since the last time you, you ran the vacuum thread. Right? And you don't want to have to go out the disk and figure out whether that, actually, that was true or not. So a really simple optimization is to maintain what's called a dirty bitmap. And you just have basically one bit, one, zero, one, for every single page in your entire database. And any single time you modify, you just flip that bit to be one, so that when the vacuum 
comes back comes back around. They just scan that thing to figure out well these are the these are the pages I got to go bring bring in and go vacuum them. So this is typically run as either again a cron job uh, that runs periodically. You can run it manually in Postgres by just calling full vacuum from the from, or vacuum from the from the terminal. Um, there's also you can also set a trigger to say you know if if my table has been updated if 20% of the table has been updated let me run the vacuum and clean things up right no one way is better than another. All right the other approach to do cooperative cleaning and this is basically where the threads as they're executing the queries when they come across old versions that they know are not visible to anybody else it's their job to clean them up as they go along right so. In this case here, it only works with oldest to newest ordering for the version chain because if it's newest to oldest and I'm always looking for the newest one, I'm never going to get to the end of the chain, right? So you never, no one's ever going to see the, the old versions. And I have to then rely on the, the background vacuuming uh, approach. So let's say that I have an index and this transaction wants to look up on object A and it's going gonna, it's gonna to land on the, um, at the head of the version chain, which is the oldest. And then as I scan along, try to figure out what version is actually visible to me, if I recognize that the version I'm looking at is actually not visible to anybody, then I want to go ahead and just mark them as deleted, and then I, I can reclaim the space. Are we done here? What's that? Yes. Exactly, yes. So unless I go back and update the index, because now the version chain is this thing, then Whoever, whatever A is pointing to is going to point to nothing. So it's sort of like this, uh, you kind of get the order correct on this, right? So you'd have to go update the index to point to this version, then anybody will, will skip around it, and then you, you can go ahead and, and, and reclaim that space that came before it. So no one way is better than another. Uh, I think most, actually, I, I don't know what MySQL does or Oracle does, but Postgres does the vacuuming. Um, m most of the other systems, I think, do cooperative garbage collection. I think when we looked, actually, I, I have a slide at the end which will show what people do. Right and again, we already talked about transactional garbage collection. We just maintain the, the version set, of, or the read/write set of transactions, and we use that to figure out uh, what's not visible to anymore. All right. So the last thing to talk about is indexes. So as I said before, the the, the primary key index is always going to point to the version chain. So any single time we create a new version and we update the version chain, uh, we have to update that. But for, um, and, and then this gets tricky now when you want to start updating the primary key, right? Because now you could possibly have two version chains for the same logical tuple. And so the way you implement this is just, when you want to update the primary key, you treat that as a delete followed by an insert of a new logical tuple. And there's some bookkeeping you have to maintain to know how to roll back if necessary. For secondary indexes, it's more complicated. So the two approaches to do this are to maintain a logical pointer where you have some kind of uh, unique identifier for the tuple that does not change. And then you have this indirection layer that you can say how to map the logical ID to a physical address or a location in, in the database. And any single time you update the, the, the tuple, you update the version chain, you just update that indirection layer, not every single index. The other approach is actually use physical pointers, which is I talked about before, where you just point directly to the head of the version chain. So anytime that gets updated, I have to update every single index. So it looked like this, right? So say we have a simple database down below, and we have our version chain running, uh, it's a pen only running newest to, newest to oldest. So for the primary key index, if I want to look up on, on get object A, right? This will just be a physical address, right? Page ID and offset to point me exactly to the head of the version chain. And any time I, if I, if I create a new version, then I go always, always, always update that. For secondary indexes, uh, you could use the physical address. Again, same issue. Anytime I update the tuple, I have to update the the secondary index to point to this. And so it's fine if I have one index, right? It's not a big deal. But now if I have a lot of them, and this is actually very common in, 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 in O2B environments, people could have you know, maybe a dozen or so secondary indexes on, on one table. Because you want all your queries to run really, really fast. 
So if I have a lot of second indexes, every single time I update the version chain, I have to update all of them. And that's, you know, that's expensive, because I, now it's a, if it's an index, I have to, you know, B plus tree, I have to traverse that, take latches as, as I go down, and then apply the update. The alternative is to, instead of storing the physical address in the secondary index, I could store actually just the primary key. Literally a copy of the primary key is the value in my secondary index. So now when I want to say find the tuple, uh, I get the primary key out of the secondary index, and then I do a lookup in the primary key index, and I figure out what the physical address is. So now any time I update the tuple, the, the head of the version chain, I just update this thing, and that automatically updates all my secondary indexes. So this is actually what MySQL does. Postgres does the, uh, the physical address. The alternative, again, the, the last approach to do a uh, logical ID is to just have some synthetic value, like a tuple ID, just think a counter always incrementing. And then there's some hash map or some hash table that says, here's how to map the tuple ID to an address. So I get a tuple ID out of the secondary index, do a lookup on here, and then I get my physical address. And again, anytime you update the version chain, I just have to update this one hash map. So again, the it depends on the workload, depends on the application domain. No one approach is, is better than other in all possible scenarios. So this is a table we've generated for a paper we published a, a year or two ago where we looked at uh, the, the sort of historical MVC systems like Postgres, Oracle, and MySQL, and a bunch of newer ones within academia and, and commercial setting. And here's just showing you how they do uh, the various design stages we talked about. So here's how they do all the different uh, concurrent show protocols. Um, and then here's how they're doing the storage. And as you see, append only uh, is actually pretty common, um, whereas I think delta is actually the right way to go. And then here's what, how they're doing vacuuming, and then here's what they're, how they're doing indexes. So again, the main takeaway here is that everyone does different things. And this is why I do want to show you a number, you know, show you results and say, all right, well, two-phase locking is better than OCC, or OCC is better than two-phase locking, because it's actually all this other crap that actually makes, makes, makes a bigger difference. And the spoiler, I would say we've done experiments. We find actually that Oracle and MySQL, and I think, uh, I think NuoDB, the way they do MVCC, uh, encompassing all these things, actually is the fastest for all to be workloads. And Postgres is actually the slowest. All right, so any questions about multi-version concurrent control? Again, I want to impress upon you that, that we're using these timestamps to figure out what versions are visible to our transactions, but it's more than, than just the visibility aspect of it. It's also figuring out uh, you know, how we're actually going to store the versions, how we update them, how we update our indexes, and things like that. OK? All right, so this is it for concurrency control in, 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 for this semester. Starting Monday next week, we're going to start talking about logging recovery. And that'll sort of be the last week of, of material you need for to build an entire database system. So everything that'll come after that, we'll talk about distributed systems and sort of sort of random other topics that go beyond the basics, right? So the way I think about this, if you understand everything so far in the course, if you understand what next week is, then you can go off and build your own data system from scratch. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right, guys. Have a good weekend. See you on Monday. <laughs> That's my favorite all <laughs> What is it? Yes. It's the S-T Cricket I-D-E-S I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T -O. Now here comes Duke, I play the game where there's no rules Homies on the cup say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit Put the bus a cap on the eyes bro Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes show. Here I come, Willie D, that's me Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park and South Central G And St. Eyes when I party by the 12 pack case of a four. Six pack 48 gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say fruit makes you fat. But St. Isaac's straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>